Hey, welcome Facebook. Welcome all of our uh, equine mule donkey friends. We are back after, gosh, it's almost been a whole year, if not a whole year. We're back and uh, with Ask Steve. Uh, ask Steve whatever question you want about your mule and donkey so that you can have a better relationship with that animal and that you can have more fun, more enjoyment, and uh, just enjoy life more overall. And uh, my name is Dave, and um, I am a longtime buddy of Steve Edwards, but we're not here to talk about me. We are here to talk about them donkeys, and uh, for those of you who don't know, this is Steve Edwards right here. Steve, how's it going? Hey, hey doing good. Kind of having fun with you a little bit. This is uh, a part-time thing that I do, a uh, firefighter here in Queen Valley, and uh, I'm not training any mules anymore, Dave. I, uh, I quit about four months ago after uh, 32 broken bones and two replaced hips. Uh, and being 69 years old, I slowed up. So I decided to go into fast lane of firefighting. Yep. Fast so lane of firefighting, like that, and, and that, a little bit safer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tell that to the car accident that I went on. It was a 67 Chevy Impala, and a 92-year-old World War II veteran was on it. And uh, the car was completely engulfed by the time we got there. Ended up foaming it. Well, here's the kicker. The, the car was full of ammunition. <laughs> I mean, you could hear the stuff hitting the trunk and this sort of thing. And, uh, and we had to foam it. So that was kind of unique. The, uh, we had to, we had to, uh, the highway department had to shut off quite a bit of, of roads. And, uh, but we posted yeah. pictures of that on, uh, we posted pictures of that on, um, on, uh, your Facebook page. That's right. Uh, good deal. We put some pictures of that on your Facebook page. Um, you know, hey, I want to make sure that we acknowledge we've got some folks hanging in and watching uh, watching us live today. Of course, one of the questions that I got from a lot of people after we announced that we're coming back and doing a series of streams was, man, I'm not going to be able to watch it live. Can I watch the replay somewhere? And absolutely. So if you are if you have to check out um, at any point in time, the replay will be here Right here on Facebook, the same link that you use to get to watch us live is the same link that you want to use to watch the replay. And so we've got a few folks chiming in here saying hello. We've got, um, let's see, we've got Ernie Mays from uh, Ard Ardmore, Oklahoma. Ardmore, Oklahoma. You gotten down to Oklahoma anytime recently, Steve? Not recently, but I, I tell you what, I've had quite a few clients this past uh, couple months from there. I've got one there right now, and he was telling me how it was... Uh, 15 below zero there yesterday. 15 below zero. That's not what it is out here in Arizona. Uh, no, I think uh, right now, let's see, it's 72 degrees on my thermometer. Yeah, of course, you're wearing you're wearing a little bit, a few more layers than I am. I'm wearing short sleeve shirts right here. I'm getting short sleeve shirts. You're getting short sleeve shirts. I'll bet it's getting a little bit warm there. We've got yeah. Judy Luce saying hello, Steve. Hey, Judy from California. We're going coast to coast. Uh, David Pingelli uh, left us a comment. Rose Stewart left, left us a comment. Lynn Keiko left, left us a comment. Harry King. So here's the rules, folks. Uh, basically, we've, we're just going to go through and we're going to answer as many questions as we can uh, over the course of the next 50, 55 minutes. And um, if you want to use the comment section below, go ahead and post your comment, uh, post your question, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get to all of them. If we're not able to get to some of them, um, we'll, be, we'll be taking the, those questions that we don't get to and we'll be adding them to the next live stream so go ahead start putting them in the uh, comment section there steve how about it you want to get going yeah let's get her done i'm i've been training on the telephone more this past year it's amazing what i'm able to get done i have people call me from other states and say hey i can't get my mule in the trailer and i say do this this and this next thing i know they get a phone call man that mule can't wait to get in the trailer yeah, yeah. right that's what we're talking about. I've seen it happen. Well, let's start with this one right here. This comes from Cindy. Uh, this is a message Cindy emailed in to us at support at muleranch.com. She says, hi, Steve. I purchased my tack from you five, six years ago. The bridle I use for my mule is just a little loose, and I have a difficult time getting over it John Boy's ears. How do I know the correct size to purchase, and do you have some clips to make it easier to get on him? I still love the saddle. It's lightweight, easy to put on, and always looks nice. What do you have to, sen to say to Cindy about selecting the right size bridle and getting it on over the ears? Okay. Number one, Cindy, I, I am not a fan of going around a problem. 
because if you've got one problem like being ear shy, you'll have another problem and then it kind of goes on from there. You should have a 19 inch brow band that comes across here, 19 inches. That should give you plenty of ear room. And then uh, what you always want to do, and people make mistakes, and so this is probably what you're not doing, you loosen up that bridle about two holes, maybe three, and let that bridle hang down. Then take it off the mule's ear, right ear first, left ear second, and when you put it on, put it on loose. Don't put it on pre-adjusted. What happens is, all too soon, we end up bumping their mouth because we're trying to get it on the ear. And we bump in their mouth and it ends up making them sore. So to keep you from pulling more on the bridle to bump the mouth, they throw their head and then you think you've got ear shy. Actually, no, you don't have ear shy. Uh, what you got is, is you're bumping the mouth. Always, always, always let the mule pick the bit up, carry it, hold it where he likes it, then adjust the bit. Never put it on pre-adjusted. So, do I, do I, have I kind of broke down and started, I designed a, a bridle that buckles in from behind, but that's not going to fix the problem. What's going to fix the problem is if you put the bridle on loose. Always put it on loose. Uh, by the way, I had a lady call me up and she said, uh, see, she, she was in, uh, in, um, New York area. Yeah. And she says, Steve, you know how you told me to put the bridle on and the mule will pick it up and hold the bit? And I said, yeah. She says, let me tell you another one. I put the britching on. We were trying to figure out how to put it on. She stretched out and as if it's where she wanted it. Mm -hmm. We went ahead and adjusted it to that spot. That was two months ago. She showed us how to put the britch on. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Well, hopefully that answers uh, Cindy's question there. Cindy, if you watch this and you have any follow-ups, please let us know. Uh, the next question I got comes from Rose Stewart. She left it here in the comment section. She says, hey, Steve, just got my second mule. I'm having trouble keeping him going in a straight line. He wanders about. I've been leg cueing him, pushing him forward. He is partially blind in one eye. Do you think that he might be... Mm, compensating. Really looking forward to hearing you on Wednesday. What do you have to say there to Rose about this mule that's wandering about? That was going to be my next question. What's his What's his eyes like? You know, has he got a cataract? Uh, is he already blind in one eye? We had a blind mule up the Grand Canyon, and he did a great job, but he got used to it. All that mule is trying to do, you got to remember, their eyes are apart, and all that mule is trying to do is go this way and this way, trying to figure out where, it's, where the trail's going. Uh, you might also want to have the vet look at it and see if maybe you might have a, a cataract in the other eye, but you're not going to change it. Since the eyes are wide apart, he's trying to see where he's going, and therefore his feet's going to go. Uh, using your legs is great. Good for you. That's good. Using your hands as well, but uh, I'd sure find out about the other eye as well. So let me go ahead and ask this. For folks who may not know what leg cueing is, will you just share real briefly what we mean by leg cueing and what good leg cueing consists of? Absolutely. Okay. So we have, we have three fingers here. All right. The center finger right here is your leg in the saddle. When you take this leg, and let's just turn it like this. When you push this leg in, the center leg, that means they're going to side pass. All right. So let's just say this is the center leg on the right hand side. We're going to push our leg against his body. He's going to move to the left. You're going to take your leg off of the right hand side. Don't put any pressure on it. So you've got to open door, close the door. Now, at the same time, this is the front leg. If I want the front end of the mule to move over, I push in with this leg and the front end of the mule moves over. Again, always make sure you have no pressure in the opposite leg. Now that's turning on uh, the, the holding the this leg, moving over to turn on the hindquarters. Now I want the hindquarters to move around the shoulders, so then I push this leg right here, and I push it in. That pushes against the hindquarter, the mule will then start going around his front end. So front end will be here, and he'll go around it. Leg cues is absolutely the best, best 
way to communicate and ride your mule. Uh, they they appreciate it so much more. And I can't I can't emphasize enough going back to the bit thing. Yeah. Don't put don't make one wrinkle or two wrinkles. All you're doing is making for an uncomfortable mule. People have been doing it with horses. They've got uncomfortable horses. <laughs> So uh, you know, uh, allow that mule to pick up the bit and carry it's far smarter than the horses. Very good. And the, don- and the donkey's even smarter. Very good. Well, the next question we got here comes from Judy. Judy Luce, she says, Hi, Steve. Glad you're back. Judy, we're glad to be back, too. My Miss Daisy is still having issues with the goats and donkeys on our street. How can I get her over this? I've walked her by it so many times, and it doesn't matter. She still freaks out. I've started getting off of her two houses away and adjust the saddle and then walk her by them and stop to check them out. She still puffs up and is ready to blow. What do you have to say to Judy? This sounds like a, this sounds like one that anybody could encounter. Well, yes, you, you can. I happen to know Daisy. I started her as a three-year-old. And we punched cows on her. We had baby calves, uh, a little bit of everything. Uh, why she's all of a sudden decided that she doesn't like donkeys and goats. That's amazing. Uh, you know, and, and one thing, I, the only thing that would come to my mind would be they're more of a predator size, and maybe she's considered them to be a predator. But, uh, you know, you're safe, Judy, by getting off. Can you fix it? No. Uh, can you ride it through? Yes. Uh, I have people all the time say, well, gee, I can, I can desensitize my mule. No, you can't because you don't have a rattlesnake or you don't have an elephant or, you know, you don't. You, in other words, when I went to world championships and Judy, you've been there, you don't have 10,000 people to train against. So you've already found you went by them goats. You went by them donkeys all this time. Nothing's changed and nothing's going to change with her. She chooses to be this way. Now, I have literally rode mules right up to the problem. And you would think, okay, they relax, everything's good. A few days later, be a similar problem in a sim in a different place, and and that's the key. They're flight and fright. So, and Miss Daisy is. Uh, you just have to ride it through a different street. Ride it through a different street. There we go. So probably not the answer you're looking for, Judy, but hopefully that helps you and gives you a little bit more clarity, knowing hey. It's not, it's not me. It's not anything I'm doing. You're doing all the right things. It's just comes down to, hey, take, take it, take the long way home, maybe, I guess. Um, if you have any follow up questions, Judy, throw them over. Yeah, Steve. Yeah. So, and the thing is, like I said, this mule was raised up around cattle. This mule has seen baby calves and this sort of thing. We have roped, I don't know how many calves and, and cattle off of that mule before I actually sold her. Uh, and, I mean, she couldn't have been more perfect. Now, you know, uh, sometimes I might say maybe it's the rider. You know, it's a possibility. Uh, all of a sudden, you grab the reins and grab the the uh, the horn or something like that and get feared just as soon as she blows, you know, gets a little scared. And getting off is a good idea. Myself, I would ride her through, but you're not going to change it. She's chose to be afraid of it, and what is she now, 17, 18 years old? Yep. Um, all right, let's go to the next question I got. This one comes in from uh, Jenny. She sent us an email at uh, support at muleranch.com. She says, my two-and-a-half-year-old mule, Jenny, follows me, answers to name, and comes when I comes to feed when I call. Um, ha- I have the halter purchased from you on her. Have tried to break her to lead, but she will not let me touch her. She uh, she will lead when the grandson leads her with his horse. What can I do to tame her to touch uh, tame her to my touch and learn to lead her? Okay, number one, the halter by itself is not the place to start. That is the second part. We got to start with the come along rope first. And yes, it's difficult to get the tum- come along rope on. Uh, number one, I would make sure she's in a twenty by twenty pin. A 20 by 20 pin, you can control her pretty easy. Uh, if you've got a nice round pin connected to it, that'd be nice to where you can put her in there. And then just start taking the rope and toss it toward her sides and things like this. But most of all, the, the rope halter is not the place to start. That's the place, that's the second stage. So for six months, you need to ride a, uh, you need to ride uh, or, or you need to use the come-along rope 
every day. Come along rope, come along rope. You tie up with the rope halter, but you must use the come along. You won't be able to lead her. She'll be able to jerk away from you really easy with the come along, with the, uh, with the rope halter. All of a sudden we lost sound. Nope, not there. No, not yet. There we are. There we go. Okay, so real quick, um, do me a favor because we've got, we've got, we've, Steve, so many mule and donkey folks have been connecting with us, watching our YouTube videos, finding us on Facebook. I mean, it's really been amazing, um, the community that we've built over the last year here through Facebook, yeah. YouTube. Um, you get the phone calls, you know. Um, so there may be some folks watching today who are unfamiliar with the come along rope, the come along hitch, and then the rope halter. Uh, last year around this time, we created a little kit with the come along rope, with the rope halter, and a training video. Um, but I want you to talk just for a few minutes about what the come along rope is, why it's important, and how does the rope halter factor into this whole, you know, halter training, you know, ground foundation training, etc. Can you do that for me? Sure, you bet. The come along rope is, is three strand. It's wax coated, and that's really important. It has to be wax coated to keep from running up and down the nose a lot and to slide out of your hands. So the idea is to be able to communicate to the, to the mule or the donkey, go forward, go right, go left, back up. By, let's just say this is the head of the, the mule here. This is the nose. When we first put the loop over top of, and we've got, we've got some videos of that, that that we can send people to, can't we? But the idea is to be able to communicate to the nose, the upper, lower part, and behind the pole, behind the ears. And behind the ears, when they pull back, that bumps them. When they try to pull to the right or the left, the come along rope bumps them. The idea of the come along rope, it's not only going to help them go forward when they resist, but when they do go forward, the pressure automatically comes off the nose and the pole. And, and that's imperative that you use that to start with. The come along, uh, the uh, rope halter has knots that go right here in the nose and shuts the wind off and then goes underneath the chin. But it doesn't have the communication behind the pole as crisp and clean. That, that rope halter needs to be the second stage of your training. Anytime you're doing any kind of training, always remember it's a six-month time frame. Training four to six hours a week. That's all. These trainers that think they got to train, train, train every day, look, it ain't necessary. If your training is right, you will be able to train four to six hours a week. Plenty of training. Build a foundation, three, six, nine, twelve. So with the, the come-along hitch, then the rope halter, and the good thing about that DVD that we put together, it shows them how to do it. You know? Yeah, I put that in the link. So if I put a link to both all of the free YouTube training videos that we've got out there, and there's several uh, with the come along rope showing specifically how to put it together and then how to do the uh, rope halter adjustment. And then I also put a link there uh, directly to the, the kit if anybody wants to get their hands on that. Real quick, we want to give some shout outs. We've got Jill Luden uh, watching from uh, Iowa. She says hello from Iowa. We've got uh, Gloria and uh, Rex watching, Meyer watching from Ohio. Uh, wind chill, negative 40 below here today. Glad you are back. <laughs> Hello. We're glad to be back, but we're glad to be back in the state of Arizona. Hope you guys, uh, hope you guys are able to, to weather that storm there. Uh, we've got Richard Matthews, uh, morning chaplain Steve. Richard, yeah, he's the captain. That's Captain Matthews. There we yeah, go, so Captain great. Matthews. Uh, yeah. We've got Sam Renee, Sam and Renee Crawford from uh, Willow, Alaska. All right. Yes, Sam, Sam just got uh, one of my saddles for his mule. And a bunch of other tack and stuff. And he went and made the mistake. He invited me to go up there to go fishing. So I guess I'm going to have to do it. You're going to have to. Yeah. You're just going to have to go up there, suck it up, and, and do it. Take one for the team. Yeah, I want to do that. But I'm also got to spend some time with the mule. You That's know, as long as there's a mule there, fishing pole in one hand and a mule in the other hand. You can't go much better than that. We should put that on a T-shirt, fishing pole in one hand. Mule rain in the other. Life is good. Uh, we've got Roger Tormanen uh, from Wyoming. We've got Yulika Wickstrom from Sweden. 
Sweet A! We've gone international now. Finally yeah. gone international. Sam says can't wait. Um, let's see. we got a couple other people here. We've got Gary Green, uh, Phil Hughes. Um, how come we never met? I just moved from Garland last November. I'm now in Tularosa, New Mexico. Let's see here. We've got uh, Kelly Borenbell. Look at you, Mr. Firefighter. Hello from Kodiak, Alaska. <laughs> Kodiak, Alaska. Oh, there's some of my favorite people up there. You were there last fall, weren't you? Yes, I was up there helping with the, the kids program, working with some of the, the teachers and trainers. How neat. Awesome program. Very cool. Well, we're so glad that all of you are watching. If you have any questions, just put them in the comment section there. Uh, we're going to keep moving. Real quick, I got I, I think this is going to be a quick one, Steve. Uh, Mike sent us an email, and uh, Mike says, can you use a mule saddle pad on a horse, and can you use a horse saddle pad on a mule? And then says, which mule saddle pad should I get? Of course, you've got three. I, there's all sorts of different ones out there, but I'm, I'm guessing Mike is looking at your website. You've got three. You've got a triple duty downhill hip and a standard. But let's go to that first question. Can you use a mule saddle pad on a horse and a horse saddle pad on a mule? Absolutely, yes. Does one work better than the other? Yes. Uh, my saddle pad is designed with... Uh, uh, Perforated neoprene on the bottom to help create the sweat, and it's Duracron up on the top. The great thing about my saddle pad is it helps keep the saddle in place. We've got some YouTube videos on that. Um, but here's the thing. <coughs> the way my saddle pad is designed, it more fits the bone structure of the mule and donkey, the, the padded area right at the bars. I have had, and I do still have people call me, and they put these pads on their horses and said they like them. So uh, I, I have to go by what they're telling me. They like them, so there we are. <coughs> you can use any blanket, all right? It just The problem is, is it moves around the saddle a lot. And that's what I try to keep from, over-tightening my cinches and using the... Uh, the, the design that I have to help keep the saddle in place. <coughs> Probably going to get me a piece of candy here or something. Oop, I lost your voice again. Sorry about that. I've got a link to the video and kind of some... Um, I'll put that in the comment section right there. Here is a link to the video where Steve shows the saddle pad. All right. There we go. All right, let's keep moving right along here. We've got uh, another question from uh, Lynn Keiko. Lynn says, a dominant mule problem here. Always keeping our two donkeys in check, chasing his mini mule that he's been uh, been with for many years. He crossed the line and knocked me down, bit me, didn't draw blood, put many miles under saddle last year. What would you have to say there when someone's got a story like Lynn's sharing? It's part of the equine world. There's always going to be the the head of the of the um, of the herd, and and that's the top of the pecking order. What I do not do is put these mules and donkeys together. I don't do it. When we did it, we always had injuries of some kind, especially if we had a dominant one. Uh, so if you go to my ranch, you'll see each mule's got his own stall. Why do I like to have each in his own stall? Not only to keep them from being dominant, which is impossible to change. You ain't going to do it. Uh, the, about the best thing I've ever done is put a dog electric collar around their neck, and when they went at the, the calf or the donkey or another animal, I hit them with it. But it still didn't change what the nature has. And the natural says, I want to be the top of the pecking order, and since I want to be the top of pecking order, you need to do what I tell you to do. So, first of all, don't put them all in the same stalls or the same corral. Especially a mule, he will try to take one of these little ones and, and mother up to him. I've seen him mother up to calves and kill calves. It's not a pretty sight. Uh, but I, I just separate them. Now, let's go, let's go some more reasons why to separate them. Separate them so you know how much feed they're taking in. Separate them so you can watch their urine and their poop. And that's really important. It's going to tell you how uh, healthy these animals are. 
when you know we clean stalls on a daily basis and we know by the color of their urine and the color of their poop and the smell of things how healthy they are and and that's really important and then the other thing is too these mules and donkeys don't need to be out get this in your mind they don't need to be out on a pasture eating all the time not these modern animals these animals uh, don't need to be on a smorgasbord we have too many fat animals just like me I go to a smorgasbord and I way overeat when these animals are out on the pasture they way overeat so put them in a separate corral each one of my stalls are 10 foot wide 20 foot deep each one of these stalls are uh, uh, set up so that they got water and feed and some shade and I can keep an eye on their feeding program super important and I can also keep an eye on them if they go getting sick it's really easy for them to get sick so that's 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 what I would do you're not gonna folks you gotta get this in your mind training is only some basics side passing turn on the forehand turn on the hand quarters this sort of thing using a bit but when the natural comes in what the good Lord put into those meals and donkeys is what's going to come out yep that's uh, that's pretty much a consistent thing that we hear from a lot of folks when they say my mules doing this my mules doing that um, how can I get them to stop how can I change their behavior and what you've said consistent consistently for so many is that it's it's in the mule it's in their nature it's what God gave to them what we have to do is we have to try to you know control a lot of the things you were talking about desensitizing how we don't talk about desensitizing because you can't desensitize right because you don't got a grizzly bear in your backyard all you can do is you can train to communicate to them when that issue comes around and certainly you know you can get them to to walk over a, a bridge or a piece of wood or something but I, I, my understanding is that when you're doing that halter training right there it's not about getting them to walk over the piece of wood that's what's down there, but it's really about getting them to listen to the halter and listen to you and know that you're the herd leader. Am I understanding that correct? Exactly. I'll give you an idea. I was riding, was moving cows around, and I was going over by the barn, and I was riding a well-seasoned mule. Uh, I would actually did some work on this mule about five years ago. Good mule. Got a good handle on him and this sort of thing. Kids always riding him. We come around the corner. And there was a spare tire leaning against the, the side of the barn. Now, you know, that little mule has come around that corner with me four or five times over this time frame. And then all of a sudden, there's that tire, and it's been there all this time, and it became a monster. And he jumped probably 10 foot to one side. You know? And it just, it's just the way it is. Flight and fright is there. Yep. Well, we've got a couple new folks hanging on here. We've got Ray Lockert saying hello. He says, hey, got, hey. Uh, glad I got one of your saddle pads. I love it. And your trail light saddle too. So that's really cool to hear. Uh, we've got Laura Ensign, um, and she's got a question here for you. And I wanted to hear what you, uh, what you had to say. She goes, how often do you need to chiropractor for mules? Mm. At least once a year. I, you know, every spring, there's two things I like to see done. I like to see their teeth floated so that they're correct. The other thing is I'd like to see uh, the, the chiropractor check them out, go over them. Especially if you get country, we've got a lot of ice and mud and slippery. Hey, it's just like us, you know, if we stumble, we could put something out. I, I see the chiropractor about once a year and get myself lined back up. Uh, so at least once a year, it's what I would do. Awesome. Let's see here. Uh, uh, Christopher Decker is watching. How's it going, Christopher? Yes. <laughs> How's it going, my man? I just saw him pop on and it says watching now. So uh, Chris is a common friend that both uh, both Steve and I have had for a, a long time. It's good to good see time. that you're hanging out with us here, Chris. Yeah. Um, let's see. The next question I got here is, will your saddle pad, this is from Lori. She sent us an email. She says, will your saddle pad work with an Australian saddle? So first, What's an Australian saddle, and then would you answer the question for us if it'll work with your saddle pad? Okay, so the Australians have developed a, a saddle pad. Uh, some have wood trees in them, some do not, and they cinch in the front, and they have kind of a big swell to lock your legs under, and then the, the legs swing really readily. Um, I, can, I can tell you that because it only has the one cinch, 
and it's balanced that way, the saddle probably rolls a lot. And that's usually the people come to my clinics and people I talk to say, I've got an Australian saddle or I've got a center fired saddle and the saddle rolls when they go to get on it. Will my saddle pad help? Yes. Will it help your saddle fit better? No, it won't. Uh, matter of fact, I've got uh, a couple different clients in Australia. I don't know if they're listening or not, but they, they uh, both have been here in the United States and one came and spent some time with me here in Arizona. The other one, David, I met him, David Scholl. Uh, I met him in, Aust uh, in uh, at Bishop last year, and he's riding my saddles. And, you know, these, you, you want your mule to be comfortable, and that's important. But the Australian saddle is, you know, my pad will help, but it's not going to fix the, the moving around like it does. All right, so the next question I got here, we'll keep rolling through, try and get to as many as possible. Uh, it's from Harry King. He says, hi, Steve, can a 12-year-old Buddy Sour Mule, uh, Buddy Sour Molly Mule, be taught to be ridden alone? She was trained to pack and has limited saddle riding time. What would you say there to Harry? It, you know, they're all going to be Buddy Sour because it's the herd mentality. The little mule that I've been riding on this past week uh, he constantly would be braying and calling out to the animals. And if I let him, he would just go right over to the others. But I don't. I use my voice, my hands, my legs, and you see. Again, Dave, this is one of these kind of things that it's the, the makeup of the mules. They want to be close to the herd. So they're tough to ride. Uh, this little mule that I was riding, he reared up on me a few times. He... Uh, kind of jumped sideways a few times. He did a little bit of a back kick out, no big deal. But he kept trying to find a way so that he could get to his buddy, his horse on the right, or the horse buddy on the left. And the only thing you can do is just ride it through. Use your voice, hands, legs, and your seat. You cannot fix a buddy sour. You know, I have, I have taken these animals uh, 50 miles away from my ranch, left them for several months, and brought them back, and within minutes, they're back being buddies again. Yep, that herd mentality, that that, mentality. that nature that's inside of them. Hope that helps, Harry. Hope that gives you a little bit more uh, more understanding on what's going on there and, and how to approach it. Uh, Roger just chimed in, had a great question. This is one that took a while for me to kind of understand. Um, you've always talked about how important it is um, and how it would be connected to so many other problems, and I just never really got it. So I think it's a great question that I want to make sure that we address. He says, can you please explain what floating the teeth is all about? Those <clears throat> teeth are connected to so many different problems that I think this is a great one we should address um, and give you an opportunity uh, to, to share with folks why getting the, float, the teeth floated regularly is such a good thing. Would you tell us a little bit about what float, teeth floating is all about? Teeth floating is imperative. It's, it helps the mules and donkeys and your horses too to be so much more focused on what they're doing. When their mouth is sore and you've got a bit in there as well, it makes it uncomfortable. So what it amounts to is this. These are the front teeth called the incisors. They bite the grass and then they pull it into the mouth. And then the teeth on the bottom and the teeth on the top grind the food. And as they grind the food, each one, you see how my fingers have different places? There'll be points. There'll be a point. There'll be a point. So what you do is you end up filing off of the teeth and so that they're all the same height. Then it doesn't hit the tongue. They're able to grind their teeth, their, grind their feed better. And then when they have been able to grind their feed better, it helps the digestive system with the intestines, the large and small intestines. Grinding their feed, the better it's grind, the, the less opportunities you're going to have to have stomach and intestinal problems. So that's basically it. What they do is they put a spectrum in their mouth and they open it up and they give them some drugs first to make them quiet. And then they put a spectrum in their mouth, they open the mouth up and then they use a drumbo drill and they, or they use a rasp and they make it right. The big thing that you want to do is the TMJs back here in the back. Now, Right here on the corner of the eye is a button. Right here in the top of the eye on the mule is a is like a little cup, like this. Okay? And what happens is when you push on that button, 
this little cup will puff up. Puff up. Every time you hit it, it'll puff up. Something to see, isn't it, Dave? It's, a, it, it, it's amazing. Before, yeah. and you, you get up close there, and you're, if you're kind of far back, you might not see it, but once you get up and you can see it in the right light, you're like, oh, it's happening. That's really going on right there. Yeah. And so the other way, too, is to take the lower part of the jaw, the upper part of the jaw, and go right, left, right, left with it. When you do that, listen for the grinding. You'll hear the grinding. And you cannot believe the attitude, better attitude your mule and your donkey is going to have when you get those teeth balanced. And I'm going to also tell you, a lot of bucking problems, a lot of runaway problems I have fixed because what happens is when they pick up on the reins, their nose is supposed to go on the vertical and their back is supposed to round out and that makes them balanced. But what happens is when they drop their head and the TMJs hang up, that hurts them, they'll blow up, and you'll end up bucking or running off. All they really want is to be comfortable. That's I mean, right. That's their, that is their communication 101 is comfort, uncomfort. Exactly, yeah. Um, we got a few more people who are chiming in. We've got Marcus Ranch. We've got Nadine uh, Shaunette from New Hampshire. We've got Hondo Hunter. We've got Hondo. Phil Hughes. We've got, uh, uh, let's see okay. here. Uh, Rebecca Farmer, uh, Christopher says, hello, Stephen, Dave, always great tuning in and expanding our knowledge from a true expert. Isn't that kind of him? Yeah, that is great. Thank you, Christopher. <laughs> That's very good. Okay, so um, let's see here. We've got another question, and this one's from Nadine. She says, I have a question concerning how to teach my donkey to drive. He rides, uh, he rides nicely, or he rides and nicely. He leads nicely going from walks in the woods. If I start to slip, slip him back and try to keep him from going in front of me, he stops cold and refuses to move. Any suggestions? Come along rope, come along rope, come along rope. Uh, and, and don't use nylon halters and don't use stud chains. But with the come along rope, when you're going into country that you're not used to doing, or if you feel that maybe there might be some buggers behind the bushes, put the come along rope and away you go. When you start your donkey, always start them without blinders. You start your mule without blinders. Blinders are just to look ahead, look straight ahead, and focus on the front. I, all of my mules, we, we train them to blinders, but I always prefer that they drove uh, without blinders, and they'll, they'll see 100, 360 around them, they're a lot happier. Uh, I have some videos, uh, Dave, I think. Uh, that could help her out. Uh, uh, communication through the lines, mm -hmm. foundation training. Get an idea. You got to start your vocabulary. Mm -hmm. You'll see me training on a on a young mule. Uh, you'll see me training on a donkey. Uh, I've got a variety of videos that could help you out. Yeah, I uh, I put a link in the um, I put a link inside of the comments to the come along rope, and I'm adding the com what'd you say? Communicating from the lines. Yeah, uh, yeah. Communicating through the lines. Okay. All right. I just put that one in there too. The great question. Uh, let's see here. Let's see. Tracy Foley from uh, Como, Pennsylvania, she, Lake Como. Uh, she says, Rocky is getting much better about me handling his feet. Thank you so much, Steve. What's the story there? Oh, boy. <laughs> she came all the way from Pennsylvania to Massachusetts. I was doing a clinic for the uh, equine affair. And she came all the way. She was my star student. Matter of fact, she was. I went ahead and just spent my time with her and one other lady who had a, a leading problem. But this mule would would get scared, and then she would get scared, and uh, and she'd grab the reins, and then the mule would get scared. I showed her how to go right, left, right, left, get the mule relaxed, and it did. And then I showed her how to use the buttons to pick up the feet. And so she's doing good. Uh, her husband actually was a, a firefighter as well. We had some quite a few conversations there, uh, but I'm going to have to go up there in Pennsylvania. I guess she's got some uh, turkeys that are trespassing on the place. <laughs> I have to take care of the turkey problem. Yeah, I mean, we have to fix that turkey problem. Yeah. What friends do? That's right. I'd, <laughs> I'd be happy to be a friend. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so I've got a question here from Mar Mar uh, Ramiro, um, and uh, I think this is a pretty good one. He says, "I grew up riding our stubborn farm mule a few decades ago. Now, me and my wife are thinking about buying a pair of mules. I was wondering if you recommend attending attending a clinic 
uh, before or after we make our own purchase. By the way, I've really enjoyed your mules, your mule videos and articles. So he's thinking about buying a mule. So you want to buy a mule? Um, yep. What would you say there? His specific question is: Should I attend some clinics before or after? Um, what would you say to him? Get as much information as you can. Do the clinics, read the books, watch the YouTube stuff, and start making a decision. You know, do, do, will this work for me? Will this not work for me? Uh, there's a lot of good horse trainers out there. Uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of the guys that are training mules too. Uh, um, there's a major difference, and and we can talk about this another time, Dave. About and we have. A uh, major difference between a mule trainer and a horse trainer. There's there's a few people out there right now that are horse trainers in a mule costume, and uh, it's kind of tough. I, I really feel I really feel bad for the mules uh, that's doing that. But going back to this, get your education. Go to do clinics, do the expos. You're going to see me do some expos. I've actually quit traveling from coast to coast. Uh, I was averaging in about uh, three to four months between fifteen to 20,000 miles uh, and during that time frame on my truck and trailer, my 40-foot toy hauler, but we're not going coast to coast anymore. Now, uh, when I get these expos, I just got an invitation to Hoosier, uh, which was really nice, and so I'm going to be going to Hoosier in May, and they're doing a new, a new program. I've got invitations to... Uh, to Germany, to Switzerland, to Italy, to France, and to New Zealand, and to uh, Australia. Oh, I just got an invitation to Chile, too, to Chile. So I'm going to be doing some of those. But uh, my days of being on the road training uh, with these clinics, I'm pretty much done with them. Do you have room in your passport? That's a lot of traveling. <laughs> well, we've got a few stamps on that passport. You know, yeah, you do. This past year, we went to Kauai and Molokai. Mm -hmm. Now, Molokai, we're going to have some video out on that. I think I sent that to you mm -hmm. of, of the guy uh, and head of the Molokai Mule Company, and he's sitting on my saddle, and I took that 28, 28 switchbacks off the side of that mountain, and he rides nothing but my saddles and pads. He's got 25 mules, and he says, Steve, I'm replacing these sorry saddles as quick as I can with your saddles. And that was fun deal. So I was in Molokai, and then I was in Kauai uh, seeing one of my apprentices, and uh, we spent some time there. And then we went to Kodiak, Alaska, and went up there to that super great kids uh, camp up there, yeah. that kids camp. That was great. Uh, and then I was in North Dakota, Massachusetts. Oh, yeah. But by airplane, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to travel by truck and trailer much anymore. Yeah. Yeah, you were putting a lot of miles on there. I I knew that I'd catch you here and there where you'd be traveling. I'd be like, "Oh, you got you got some time." You're like, "I got six hours in the car." So I'm glad to hear that you've uh, that you've decided to start flying a little bit. Yeah, it's you know that trailer of mine. It's an 07. We bought a brand new in 07. I, I've got almost 150 thousand miles on that trailer. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, I've got another question from Monica Brent. She says, "Hello from Florida." Uh, my five-year-old mammoth donkey has about six months of saddle time on him, but hasn't been ridden in about two years. What do you suggest as the first steps to get on him? I've been saddling him up and working on ground manners, and he's been very tolerant so far. He's a sweet guy, but I don't want to start him off too abruptly and create a problem. What should my process be? Thanks, Advance, and I love these live streams. What would you say to Monica? She's, she's doing great, Dave. Uh, doing groundwork first. Congratulations. Do that. Very, very important. Uh, I've got a video I might suggest to you, Monica. It's called uh, Colt Foundation. And it shows step-by-step -step groundwork and this sort of thing and then climbing in the saddle. And you can see how we use somebody else to help us out. Somebody on the come-along rope while they climb in and then we lead them around. We have five different people in this video. None of them have ever been on a bronc before. Uh, your little donkey's ahead because uh, you've already been riding, but you're smart by not climbing on. Uh, even my wife's mule, when he, she was still alive, uh, 28 years old, when we would come back from our clinics, the first thing I would do is do my groundwork, see where she was. When she felt comfortable and I felt comfortable, I climbed on and we rode off. Voice. Dave, I don't hear your voice. 
<laughs> so I'm typing. I'm typing while you're talking, and um, yeah. the way my microphone works is if I'm typing, you can you can hear it come through, and you can oh, hear okay. it in the uh, you can hear it in the replay. So I'm trying to be mindful of that, but I keep forgetting to hit unmute. So that's what's going on here. Right. I've just got. I'm a little rusty. Okay, yeah, it's we are. it's been yeah. a little bit of time, yeah. so I'm a little rusty, but I will get it. I promise you. I'm committed to it. There you go. Yes, we're there. All right. Yep. So the next question that I've got comes from uh, Cindy Sassman. She says, hi, Steve. My question is my mule constantly gets her tongue over the bit, and she did it in a snaffle, and I now removed her, uh, moved her to a correction bit as she does her cues uh, well, works mostly off leg cues. I'm very light on her, but a month ago, uh, the tongue issue concerns me. Uh, but mouth. Very light on her mouth, but the tongue issue concerns me. She hangs her tongue out of her mouth, and it seems to suit her. Is there anything I can do to fix this? This is a biggie. What do you got to say? Oh, yeah. Listen to your mule. She's saying, hey, dummy, you got the bit too high in my mouth. I was just talking about this earlier. Folks, this is not a horse, and we shouldn't even treat a horse this way, but we don't create one wrinkle or two wrinkles. And when they get their tongue over the bit, we don't change bits. Don't do that, okay? It's okay to use your correctional mouthpiece. It's okay to use the snaffle. And by the way, both of them are different because the correctional mouthpiece on my bit compared to the one you have with the horse sets back in the palate. My bit sets forward in the palate. It helps break the nose over easier. So a lot of people look at my correctional mouthpiece and say, oh, I got one like Steve's. No, you don't. It's got to be made by Rainsman, and I designed it. So let's go back. What do I do? Again, every time I put a bit in a mule's mouth or a donkey's mouth, I do not have it pre-adjusted. I put the snaffle bit, which is the lighter of the two, put it in the mouth, let it hang down where it's bumping the teeth. Now, on a molly mule, you're going to have you're going to have the incisors. Here we go, right here. Incisors. Mm -hmm. On a John mule, you're going to have a canine. So on a Molly mule, that bit is going to be down, hanging, bumping on the teeth. Let the mule spend time. It's going to pick it up, put it down, going to put his tongue all around, going to get his tongue over top of it. But when that bit starts rubbing on the bars in his mouth, he's going to put his tongue back underneath the bit. He's going to pick up the bit and carry it. And he's going to show you where he likes the bit the best. Now, Everything in 3, 6, 9, 12. Today, I'm going to put the bit in the mouth, and I'm going to watch the mule pick it up and put it in the corners of his mouth each time, three times. When he's quiet, I'm going to take it off a few days later. Not every single day, three to six hours a week is a lot, but a few days later, put it back in the mouth, the mule will reach down and pick it up quicker. 3, 6, 9, 12. So I did three, now I do six times and then the mule picks it up and packs it quicker, I take it off. Notice I'm not riding. I'm letting the mule pick the bit up and pack it. The next thing I do, of course, the 9 and then the 12. Once the mule is picking up this snaffle bit correctly, hold it where he wants it, do not adjust it to that spot. Don't do it. Let him pack the bit for six months. He's going to change his mind different times, different things. And also, important, get the teeth floated. Get the teeth floated. You get the teeth floated, you fix the foundation problem. You let them pick up the bit, you fix the tongue problem. You let them pick up the bit, you're going to have more of a comfortable animal. You let them pick up the bit, they are not going to fight you. That bit does not have to create one wrinkle or two wrinkles. People are awed when I take and I pull the bit down and they see it bumps the front teeth. And they say, well, it doesn't look like it. I say, well, the mule is packing a bit. Now, the correctional mouthpiece, same way, except for you're not going to go all the way down to the front teeth. You're going to let it hang down about an inch or so from the corner of the mouth. The mule pick it up, put it down, put it down, move it all around. When the mule gets quiet, that bit you will adjust to the mouth, that bit. But you do not put the bit on pre-adjusted, folks. Mule and donkey folks, listen to me. You want a mule that's going to be comfortable. You want a donkey that's going to be happy. Do not create one wrinkle or two wrinkles. Do not put on a pre-adjusted bit. That is the second most biggest problem that most of my mule and donkey people have. Actually, my third. Uh, my, my first one 
is the mule skin where it drags everybody around. Second one's the saddle. Third one is the bit fella. Very good. Well, I'm sure I'm sure that's not the last we're going to talk about bits. No, uh, it's a hot topic. We're actually getting really close to publishing a uh, an article. Um, everything you need to know about bits for mules. We've got an article that we put on the website. As a matter of fact, I'll share a link. It's everything that you need to know about mule saddles. That was a big theme when we did these live streams in the uh, in the springtime of last year. And so we put together a, a, the most comprehensive article out there on the internet about mule saddles. So I'll share a link to that. We're getting ready to do, we'll do the same thing for bits here. Um, I got another question, but before I get to that, uh, we've got Kevin Albright watching and he says, hi guys. So, hi, so he, he, he posted this earlier in the broadcast. He says, hi guys, was disappointed to hear about Hoosier Fair that they didn't invite any mule trainers this year. I'll put in a good word for you to get back in 2020. And then you said, that you'll be going to Hoosier Fair. And so yes. he says, so he texted in another uh, comment and he goes, maybe they went ahead and listened to my advice. I, you know, I, I, I'm sure they did. Thank you very much, Kevin, for doing that. That's the how it happens, isn't it? Call me up. Hmm? That's how it happens. It, it happens from, from folks who are watching here calling up these expos and, and, uh, and shows and saying, hey, you got to get Steve Edwards out there. You got to get some mule people out there. Yeah, I was amazed. These, they call me up. They don't usually hire people so fast back to come back, but they said they had so many people because I addressed horses as well as donkeys as well as mules when they asked me questions. So they said they had more people uh, ask to have me come back than any one trainer the past five years. I was I was ecstatic. I was blown away. But you know it takes guys like Kevin here. Says, hey. Take a look and see. You know, yeah. And I appreciate you, Kevin. Thank you. Yeah, we really do appreciate that. We've got a question here from Luke, um, and he says, uh, Will you please share your thoughts on turnout blankets and coats in extreme cold conditions? i got to admit, I don't know what that means. So can you explain what the question is and then answer his question? Okay. Uh, basically what it amounts to is uh, they put on a blanket. It's quilted. It goes around the neck. Some of them go completely over top of the head around the neck, and it helps keep them warm, and it helps keep them dry. But that's the that helps that part. But here's what happens. The tips of the ears get frozen off. I had a horse called Frosty. Her ears were about an inch long. That was it. Had another mule called Chapo, and about half of his ears were gone. Frost, you know. The frost froze those ears. So if you do anything at all, just like I talked to uh, uh, Brian, oh, what's his name from, uh, from, from Michigan, last name Brian. He's a mule writer, and he writes several magazine articles and this sort of thing. Forgot his first name. But he texted me last night and said, Steve, it's going to be 30 below zero here in Michigan. What should I do? My mule wants to stay outside. And I said, if you don't want your mule to look like a horse and get the ears frozen off, get him inside. And because that's the big problem. As you can see, a lot of these animals end up getting frozen ears. But blanket them, I can tell you that I've been to Montana hunting, uh, uh, been to Colorado hunting, cold, 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 cold. And I really believe these animals would prefer not to be covered. You know, I really do. The biggest my concern is make sure they can get underneath a tree or get some kind of shelter because of the frozen ears. You know, that's that's where I can see a problem. Great. Um, let's see here. Another question. So this, <laughs> I said, that's probably not going to be our last question about bits. And uh, it's not. We've got Dina Peters Finley chiming in. Hi, Dina. Glad to have you here. She says, how do you determine the correct bit size width? Which this is what we're going to put in that article. But what would you say right here? How would you determine the correct bit size for your animal, for your mule, for the purpose that you're, you know, wanting to use the bit? Yeah, uh, you know, Greg Darnell is a good friend of mine and builds, has built bits for 40 years. We've had tons of, of discussions about this. Uh, take a, a quarter inch string, put a knot uh, about 12 inches on one end of the string, and then Put the, the, the string inside, the quarter inch string inside the mule's mouth and then mark it and put another knot. It should come out, uh, on your average saddle mule about five and a quarter inches. But it's going to depend on if it's a snaffle bit or if it's a finished bit. 
It's also going to depend on how big their lips are because a lot of people want the bit to be eat, touching the corners of the mouth. You don't want that. I like to have a finger going each side of the bit. That's my personal preference. Uh, and mainly because I teach them to pick up the bit and carry it, which is different than everybody else. But that's about the easiest way to measure it. And so we've, uh, we've got a great chime in here from Yolanda in Poland, one of our, uh, one of our yeah. most loyal watchers from the springtime. Uh, Yolanda's uh, chiming in here. What time is it there, Yolanda? Is it a, is it a 12 hour time difference? It's something like that, isn't it? Probably going to be like 1 a.m., 2 a.m. Yeah, there. It's like 2 o'clock in the morning there. <laughs> yeah. She is a faithful watcher, a big time yes. fan, and we're super glad that she's able to join us here. Um, you Yolanda, Ch oh, go ahead. You remember the blanket she, she made up to put over her mule? Yes. Yeah, that gives you an idea about what the blanket what it kind of looks like. Well, she, she says here, she goes, she goes, I have blankets on my molly because there is no shelter where she's standing outside during the day and also because of the rains uh, that we get all the time. She says rain, it's rain. Uh, uh, yeah. 23, 26, so I guess 11, 11, 26 p.m. where she's at right now, so uh, so not quite as late as I thought, but still, we're really glad to have you here. Uh, yeah, Yolanda, she constructed a, uh, a completely custom covering um, for her mule, I mean, covered everything all the way down to the hooves, all the way up to the ears too. So it was a pretty, it was a pretty huge undertaking, but a yeah. uh, a pretty great, uh, pretty great end result. We're glad to have you here. Uh, oh, and we've got uh, uh, Suze Kuiper watching. She's the one that says twenty three twenty six. So two two Netherlands uh, right here watching. So very very glad to have you guys. Um, Steve, is there anything else that's come up in the last couple weeks that you've had conversations on the phone um, that uh, that you want to talk about? We've got a few more minutes here. Those are all the questions that have come in. Um, wanted to know if you had anything else that came up that uh, that that folks have been wanting to know. You know, I it's, it's amazing. I have been training more mules and donkeys on the phone this past year than it's, it's just incredible. They call me up. I answer the question. That's amazing. They call me up a couple of days later and said, it worked. It worked. It worked. It's great. Uh, you know, Dave, we're trying to get the information out there. You're great at putting articles out there, the YouTube stuff. We want to have as much free stuff out there as possible. Uh, I can tell you I've had a few people say, oh, you you don't really think your come along rope works. Or you don't, aren't you worried about you're going to hurt somebody? Look, you're around these animals. People are going to get hurt. I'm trying to give you free information that's going to work. Uh, it's worked for me for 40-some years. It's worked with the old cowboys for, uh, before that. And, and, you know, a cowboy and for a living, as, as I have over the years, uh, I've pretty much tried about everything and seen all kinds of training all over the world. Uh, if it don't work for you, don't use it. But, you know, I find it works for me, and I've got tons of happy customers. One thing I would like to do, you know, you can see here it says a firefighter and this sort of thing, Steve Edwards. Uh, we, we have a, a deal going on right now, Dave, where we're trying to get a new engine for our fire department. Now, this is a volunteer fire department. We have, uh, we have a chief. We have a battalion ca commander. We have two full-time firefighters. And then we have about an average of about 10 to 12 volunteers. And we do all kinds of stuff. We do helicopter training, uh, we wildline training. Uh, we just got done doing some uh, uh, training last night with our radio stuff. I said, I'll say this. We are putting on a raffle where we were raffling off uh, these tickets for guns. We have 22 guns that we're raffling off. It costs $50 a ticket. We're using this money to put to one side so that we can buy an engine. So this is how we're doing it. We're doing pancake breakfasts, whatever we can. But look, email me. If you would like to get some tickets or call me at the 602-999-6853 uh, and say, hey, Steve, I want to buy a ticket. I'll put your name on it. I'll shoot a picture of it and get in there. It's to help these firefighters. And, and like I said, we're, we're working for free. Uh, and uh, we it's been... Uh, the hours that we put in doing it and the training and stuff. So if I can get help there, that'd be great. Uh, but, uh, folks, I, I really want to impress upon you again that mules and donkeys are awesome. They're absolutely incredible. Can you use 
all kinds of techniques, yes. Not just mine, I'm telling you, is going to be there. Listen to this person, listen to that person, watch them, see the results. And if it works for you, use it. But get out there and get education. That's what we're trying to do here at the ranch. And we're trying to give you free information in, in visual, in videos, uh, on YouTube, whatever we can do, lots of articles. And if you've got some ideas that you, you want some help with, I'll be happy to do it. Uh, but but let, let us help you. Give us a call, please. We want to be there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see here. We've got a couple people that just popped in. We've got Kristen Voigt saying, Hi, Steve. Hello from California. Kristen, Craig, and Charm the Mule, we love you. <laughs> let's see here. <laughs> You. Yep. We've got Haley Williams. Hey, Steve, it's 18 degrees here in Virginia. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. We've got uh, David from Australia. Hey, David. <laughs> Doggone it all. I've been trying to get a ride for Dave to go down the canyon. Uh, they have got, they've got a new management up there. Dave is just driving us crazy. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to find a way for him, but uh, they've got a whole new program up there that's kind of frustrating. But anyway, uh, are you going to Australia at all? Actually, I, I was hoping to do it this year, and I can't. I can't get it done. Right, just no right. way. But next year, Dave says I've got to come there so I can uh, go there and judge a mule and donkey show. So yeah. next year, I'm definitely going to put it in into place. Uh, I had some things happen this year. My mom died a year ago tomorrow. She passed away and went home to be with the Lord, and then. My best friend passed away two weeks ago, Andy Anderson, and that was kind of tough on me. And so that kind of took up some time. Uh, but I just, uh, I'm just right now. I just, I'm not going to do any more traveling overseas for now. But next year, Dave, here I come, buddy. Let me know if you need a travel partner, a travel buddy. There you go. <laughs> Uh, my uh, my uh, wife is definitely, uh, she does a good job of handling luggage. Yeah. She can lift anything now. She's gotten pretty strong. <laughs> yeah, very, very good. Hey, let's end with one final question. Uh, yeah. Kevin had a follow-up to the uh, the cold uh, in the ears. He says, how cold can them ears take? We're hitting negative six degrees here in Indiana. <coughs> I have been to uh, the bottom of the Grand Canyon at eight degrees below zero. And I have been up in Montana at about 10 below zero. Uh, I'm going to tell you, it, it could be any temperature. It really can. Um, but uh, you, you're just going to have to try to figure it out, buddy. I, if you can get them inside, do it. If you can get ear covers on them, that's the way to do it, too. You know, It's that frostbite that's what does the trick. And that, that makes a mess of them. All right. And uh, on that, folks, uh, one of the things that we would love to have you do is to tag any of your equine friends, family members in the comment section so that they can get uh, so they they can get this in front of them. Your network is much bigger than our network is your connections, your reach. It's a lot bigger than our network connections and our reach. And so we'd love for you to if there's someone that you think this information that we're putting out there, um, if there's some folks out there who are really trying to, to, to just enjoy that relationship that they've got with their mule or their donkey and you think they would benefit, go ahead and tag them in the comment section. And then the other thing that you can do, which would be a really big help for us, is to share the broadcast and share this uh, share this replay. And, and so when you're looking there on Facebook, uh, you'll see a couple buttons. You'll see one that says share with a little arrow. You just click that, share it to your wall, write what you appreciated most about it or what you appreciate most about Steve or the content. Um, you know, If your question was answered, share that. Uh, but if you could do that, that would be a super huge help because one, we're going to get a lot of really great questions that way. Um, and, uh, and two, it's going to make sure that the folks who need the information the most get it in front of them. That's what we find. A lot of times, folks don't know the difference between the horse and the mule and donkey. They think an equine is an equine, and they really want the best for their animal, and they're doing everything that they can to, you know, to solve these problems, and they don't know that there's actually equine, mules, and donkey-specific things that, that they need to be aware of. So if you could do that, that would be a huge help for us, but even more, it would be a huge help for those folks who are desperate for this type of information to finally realize, hey, you're not alone in this. There's actually some folks out there, a community of folks out there, who are talking about this stuff and getting real results. So, Steve, with that, I think that's it for this week. Thank you, everybody, for hanging out. Any final words, Steve? 
Well, if you contact me and say, hey, you want to buy us an engine for the fire department, that would yeah. be great. Or if you just want to spend $50 for a ticket. And I'm sure uh, David's got a lot of money in Australia that he'd like to buy a ticket. <laughs> you, you hear that? You're getting called on there, David. <laughs> getting called on there. Steve, thanks so much. We're really happy to uh, be back online here. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks. Looking Leave forward. any questions that you've got in the comment section. We'll try to get to those and uh, add them to next week's agenda. Uh, God bless, and we'll see you soon. Blessings to you. Bye-bye.